Today I'm in Boston Common to talk about two things. The first, William Dawes, and the second, the Shamit Peninsula. And they do go together. One was a patriot whose story is going to sound very familiar, and the other no longer exists. If you're an American, there's a good chance you've heard at least the beginning part of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem, Paul Revere's Ride in which he says, Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. But he could have easily replaced that with, Listen, my children, take a pause, and hear of the midnight ride of William Dawes. And that's because, along with Paul Revere, William Dawes was one of several riders that night. Dawes and Revere left Boston simultaneously, with Revere rowing across the Charles River to Charlestown before climbing onto his horse, while Dawes departed the city on land, passing through Boston Neck shortly before the city was shut down by the British. William Dawes Jr. was born in Boston, Massachusetts in 1745. By trade, he was a tanner, but he was also active in Boston's militia. Dawes was instrumental in Boston's militia, securing four cannons from British Army control in 1774. And later on, he also helped steal two cannons out of a building that was under guard by the British, sneaking it through a window and out the back of the building before hiding it in a schoolhouse. But what he is most famous for is the same as Paul Revere. In the months leading up to April 1775, Tensions around Boston were growing somewhat heated, and there was an expectation that at any moment, the British could march on the local militias in order to crush the resistance that was growing, calling for revolution. The only reason they would be doing this would be to push into the countryside to either attack or commandeer colonial assets. The leader of the Sons of Liberty, Dr. Joseph Warren, assigned Paul Revere as well as William Dawes and several other riders to ride from Boston into Lexington, Massachusetts in order to alert continental leaders like John Hancock and Samuel Adams that they were in danger of being arrested by by the British regulars. Paul Revere set a plan that lanterns would be hung in the Old North Church to alert those in the local Boston area, as well as riders across the Charles River in Charlestown, of what is happening. One lantern would be lit if the British were to march by land into the countryside. Two lanterns would be lit if the British were to cross Charles River by boat. On the night of April 18th, two lanterns were lit as British regulars made their way across Charles River in order to march into the countryside, arrest local leaders, as well as take over a munition supply in Concord. From Boston, Paul Revere and William Dawes set out, William Dawes taking the land route, crossing Boston Neck shortly before the British closed it off from the rest of the state, while Paul Revere rode across the Charles River getting on his horse in Charlestown. From Charlestown, Paul Revere would head north to Medford to alert local militias, while other riders would head to the northeast. William Dawes crossed through Roxbury, Brookline, and Cambridge, alerting the militias and local leaders as he went. Dawes was allowed through the town gate because he was a well-known tanner in the city and the British sentries recognized him, allowing him to pass through the checkpoint despite the fact that the town was in the process of being locked down. Prior to Revere reaching the shores of Charlestown after rowing from the city, a rider had already been sent out from the town to Lexington, but having possibly been captured by the British, he never reached the destination and his identity remains a mystery today. Paul Revere, having a shorter route and faster horse, reached Lexington just before William Dawes did, and the pair alerted John Hancock and Samuel Adams that they were at risk of being arrested by the British regulars who had now crossed the Charles River and were heading to the northwest to Lexington and Concord. At Lexington, Dawes and Revere were joined by a young physician named Samuel Prescott, and the three rode from Lexington into Concord. A British patrol made up of British mounted officers stopped the trio on the road, and the three rode in opposite directions, with Dawes riding into the yard of a nearby house, shouting that he had lured two officers there, and the British gave up following him out of fear that they were being ambushed. Dawes' horse bucked him off in the commotion and ran off, and Dawes ended up walking back into Lexington while Revere was captured. Prescott managed to get past the British, alerted the militias in the town of Lincoln before making his way to Concord, where he told his brother and other local leaders that the British were going to attempt to take the munitions located in Concord. The church bells of Concord rang, waking up the American regulars, and the British, who had been marching at that time through Cambridge, no longer had the element of surprise that they were coming. All the while, these riders were going from town to town, alerting the local Americans that the British were marching to suppress the Continental leadership 
the Lexington militia were the first to encounter the British regulars. Firing broke out on the town's common, and eight Americans were killed. The British regulars continued their march to Concord in order to secure the town and destroy or take the military supplies that were cached there. It was at this point that the militias from the local areas around Concord engaged the British regulars in a fight at the North Bridge, believing that the British were burning the town to the ground. Three British and two Minutemen were killed during the fighting. At the same time, a reserve of British regulars were leaving Boston, bringing with them cannons and marching through Cambridge onto Lexington. British fighting in Concord began to become overwhelmed and started a retreat back to Lexington. As they did this, the provincial American forces grew as the towns who had been alerted were sending riders to join in the fight. This turned into a 15 mile long battle that lasted all of the next day. The British were reinforced at Lexington by the reserve contingent that had left Boston, but even that wasn't enough. More and more Minutemen were riding from the outlying towns to join their countrymen, and the British were quickly becoming overwhelmed as they attempted to retreat back to Boston. So many Minutemen joined that the British ended up being outnumbered two to one before making it back to the shores of the Charles River where they could row across back into the city of Boston. By the end of the day, 243 British regulars were killed, wounded, or missing. It was then that the Siege of Boston began. The Patriots had secured their first victory in the first day of the American Revolution. There are very few memorials to William Dawes. One in Harvard Square in Cambridge, Massachusetts. There were several other riders that night that alerted the countryside of the British movements, including Samuel Prescott, young physician who met Revere and Dawes during their ride. Prescott managed to make it to Concord. While Paul Revere was captured, both Prescott and Dawes escaped, and Prescott continued to warn all that he could on his way to Concord. Following that night, other riders went further into the states, including Israel Bissell, who rode from Watertown, Massachusetts, Massachusetts all the way to Philadelphia over the course of five days, covering 345 miles along the Old Post Road, shouting to arms to arms and carrying a message from one of the Continental Generals, which was copied at each of the places that he stopped, in order to redistribute amongst the militia of that area. Sybil Ludington, a 16-year-old girl, daughter of a colonel in the colonial militia, made an all-night horseback ride to alert forces in both New York and Connecticut. Unfortunately, all of these riders are mostly overshadowed due to Revere being the main focus of Longfellow's poem. While Revere rode across the Charles River to Charlestown to begin his ride, Dawes crossed a 120-foot wide strip of land known as Boston Neck, at the time the only land connection of the city of Boston to the surrounding areas. Just after he rode across the Neck, the British sealed it off by closing the fortified gates leading into the city.
the present day outline of the city shows almost no place that could be considered a neck and the city itself can barely be considered a peninsula. And that's because the city was originally connected by that Boston neck that William Dawes rode across to alert his countrymen. Boston was originally a peninsula known as Shawmut Peninsula and it was connected to the rest of the state at the town of Roxbury via Boston Neck, that 120 foot wide stretch of land that connected the peninsula to the state. On either side of that neck was deep mud and marshlands, making it almost impossible to get to the peninsula except through Boston Neck, which is why it was so easy for the British to shut off the city after Dawes rode across the neck. Shawmut Peninsula was originally settled by one man named William Blackston, or Blackstone, depending on how you want to pronounce it. He became the first colonist to settle in Boston, living alone there, before allowing about 50 Puritans from Charlestown to join him in 1630. He lived on the north end of the peninsula, across the river from Charlestown, in what became Blackstone's Point. The peninsula at the time had five hills. One hill that would be later renamed Trimount or Tremont, meaning Triple Mountain, consisted of three hills, Mount Vernon, Beacon Hill, and Pemberton Hill. The other two hills, Copse Hill and Fort Hill, rounded out the total five hills on the small 800-acre peninsula. These hills played a large role during Revolutionary War battles around Boston. As people continued to settle within the city, over the next hundred or so years, Mill Pond was created by building a dam, which was used to power grist and sawmills in the area. Boston Mill Corporation began to fill in Mill Pond due to the fact that the water had become stagnant and dirty and the mills were no longer using it for power. The city allowed the corporation to fill in the pond at their own expense and in exchange the corporation could sell the land that they had built. This first area filled in became what is known as Bullfinch Triangle. In order to fill the pond, horse-drawn wagons filled with gravel from cutting down both Beacon Hill and Copse Hill were brought over to the pond and dumped in. Tremont originally reached almost 140 feet above sea level and was the dominant physical feature of the peninsula. Only a reduced portion of Beacon Hill remains along what is now known as Tremont Street. It took 21 years to complete, finally being finished in 1828. The entirety of Copse Hill was cut down except for one three-acre cemetery, which they built a retaining wall around in order to prevent it from collapsing. The Boston and Roxbury Mill Corporation built another dam across Back Bay in 1814. This was intended to use the tides to create energy for the mills. They also built one of the first toll roads leading into the city along the dam, which bypassed Boston Neck, the only connection to the mainland prior to 1814. Once again, the water became stagnant and dirty, and the project was never able to be utilized to make the money that was expected from the construction. And only three mills were ever built in vicinity of the dam, bringing in low amounts of revenue, and the city began filling in this dammed off area as well in 1857. This took over 50 years, with trains bringing cars of gravel from the outlying areas into the city each day. And when most of Boston was destroyed in 1872 by fire, a lot of the rubble was also dumped into the dammed off area in Back Bay. It was finally completed in 1882, doubling the size of the Boston Peninsula, and the area was named the Back Bay Neighborhood. Additional areas and including South Cove were also being filled in around 1830, and Fort Hill was cut down to fill in South Cove, creating what is now Chinatown as well as the Financial District. One of the last hills, Pemberton Hill, was cut down in 1835 by the Boston and Lowell Railroad Company in order to fill in tidal flats as well as build railroad tracks. The last area filled in was West Cove in 1865, which added another 200 acres to the city. And by the end of all of this filling, the city had more than doubled in size. By damming these areas, they separated them from the Charles River as well as the bay, preventing any major shifts in tidal changes, and prevented further encroachment of water. Pollution and wastewater were also buried in the area, affecting public health, and they used this new area to build parks as well as improve the harbor add railroad tracks, depots, as well as create wharfs and other shipping facilities that could facilitate Boston being one of the preeminent cities along the eastern seaboard. This also enticed immigration and land filling into the surrounding areas around Boston, not just around the city. Also added area that would eventually become Boston's Logan Airport. The modern coastline was pretty much complete by around 1867, and besides a few smaller areas, not much has changed since then. You can almost make out Shawmut Peninsula around modern day Boston because the, the neighborhoods built on the areas that were filled in and reclaimed are mostly grid, while the areas that started out on Shawmut Peninsula 
Peninsula aren't exactly as organized. If you enjoyed the videos, check out the link in the description below if you want early access or behind the scenes content on my Patreon. Either way, thanks for watching. As always, until next time, get lost.